Welcome to Free Media, Free Minds, the show where we talk the media and society. I'm Helga Janssen. And I am Pumez Amtegazi. In South Africa, we have a right to freedom of expression. That is, freedom to receive or impart information and ideas. You and I as consumers have the right to make an informed choice. In Free Media, Free Minds, we ask, what role does the media play in helping or hindering our right as consumers? The Consumer Protection Act not only regulates the marketplace, but also protects us and gives us the right to fight back when things go wrong. In the program, we ask, how ethical and transparent is the advertising of goods and services? Where does the responsibility lay in providing the correct information on the food that you and I buy, on the products and services that we use? And where is the balance for the media to be regulated? We have in our studio guests with us who will help us talk through this. Imran Makudin from the National Consumer Forum, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Heidi Swanby from the African Centre for Biosafety, a researcher for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Next to her we have Fakhri Hassan, part of an, used to be part of an organisation called Safe Age, now an independent advocacy campaigner in the GMO labelling sector. Let's have a look at the following clip. It tells the story of the damaging impact of lies and labelling in the food industry. <coughs> Orion Cold Storage is an importer and distributor of bulk frozen food stuff, supplying wholesalers, retailers, the catering sector and manufacturers with distribution throughout Central and Southern Africa. The company, which is based in Musenberg in Cape Town, specializes in frozen meat, poultry and dairy and also raw materials from meat products for pharmaceutical purposes. Earlier this year, the South African Meat Industry Company and the Red Meat Industry Forum of South Africa received complaints about alleged illegal activities underway at Orion. Then a whistleblower who works at the company came forward with undercover footage he had taken on his cell phone between February and August this year. It's alleged that pork hearts are being brought into the country from Belgium and Ireland packed in cardboard containers. The boxes are then relabeled and sold as sheep or beef veal hearts and in some instances are marked as halal. These labels are allegedly supplied by Orion's director Patrick Gartner and are applied after the pork hearts arrive in South Africa. In one video, white containers with blue labels are stacked on pallets in the company's dry storeroom. Employees are seen using heat guns to remove original blue labels from the containers. The blue labels show the contents of the containers are actually pork hearts from Belgium or Ireland. The new labels read boneless veal hearts, product of Australia, or boneless sheep hearts. It's also alleged that water buffalo meat is being imported from India and is being sold to unsuspecting members of the trade as AB grade beef. It's claimed poultry is being imported from Spain by the United Kingdom and is then relabeled as halal when it is in fact not. In this video, a staff member admits to quickly blessing the product by applying a sticker and acknowledges she received the stickers from Gartner. No Kangaroo meat is allegedly brought into the country from Australia and is renamed as Chuck and Blade, which is a beef cut, and new labels are then applied. In another video, white containers with black, yellow and red lids indicate that the producer is an exporter of venison in Australia. An employee wipes the bottom of the box and a bogus label showing a barcode is applied over the printed bottom to hide the fact that the product comes from Australia. The container is then shrink-wrapped and sold on. Further footage shows a label printing machine, printing labels apparently designed by or on the instructions of Gartner. Expiry dates are removed from frozen turkeys and then sold to buyers as new. Another video shows how non-food grade milk powder for animal feed is removed from its original packaging, relabeled as skim milk powder fit for human consumption and is then sold on. Employees use heat guns to remove labels from brown bags and new forged labels are applied which claim the product is food quality and is halal. It's believed this animal feed may have found its way into baby formula. According to the Red Meat Industry Forum, forgery is taking place on a grand and continuous scale. The forum, along with the South African National Halal Authority Trust, went to court earlier this week and were granted an order allowing them to search Ryan's premises under the authority of the Sheriff of the Court. They will go to court again today to apply for an interim interdict to prevent the company from altering information of products and relabeling products. The forum says it cannot speculate which products on shop shelves have been affected and cannot say at this stage which items consumers should avoid.
However, they say they are investigating this. Eyewitness News has offered right of reply to Orion Cold Storage and has not received a response. Mandy Wiener, Eyewitness News. If you've just joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. You've just watched the clip called The Orion Meat Scandal. It's really powerful stuff. Mm. Imran, that was really, it was scary. What do I need to know when I walk into a, a store when I buy my evening meal? What is my right as a consumer when I'm buying meat products or food? Well, um, as you saw from the clip, that is a deliberate label fraud. So that was a criminal act that, that we witnessed there. Mm. And um, the, the, the Consumer Protection Act actually protects us from specifically this kind of um, actions from unscrupulous uh, suppliers. Yeah. So, yes, as a consumer, your rights are protected within the Consumer Protection Act with regards to specifically labeling, that you have the right to know specifically what you're buying, that the product that is being um, on the label is exactly the same product that's in the container that you purchasing so this is the essence of that and this is your right as a consumer so in terms of how this impacts you in your decision making process you are making an informed decision on the media the label being that media being given to you can I trust that, that label can I really trust that label I mean this was really scary and I say this is scary because this plant happens to be very close to where I where I live and I'm assuming it's a distributor to the supermarkets around there. So can I trust what's on the label, really? Well, after that, um, emphatically, no. Yeah. I think there's a lack of enforcement. Um, we're advocating for much stronger um, you know, um, penalties mm. in terms of labelling fraud and specifically in sh uh, enforcement. So on the part of the... We've got a very... Um, comprehensive legislation yeah. with regards to protecting consumer rights but when it comes to the enforcement of those rights there's absolutely no capacity and so I think yeah. that is where the biggest issue lies and that is why this uh, the incidence of label fraud is still so prevalent and it happens throughout um, the consumer goods industry. But, hold, hold that thought, hold that thought. I think Pumeza has um, a question. For, he he for Heidi, yeah. Heidi. She's, yes. the, she's a scientist here so tell yes. us Heidi. Um, <laughs> as a researcher can you please tell us more on what you found in our South African food? Well, my expertise is particularly around genetically modified okay. food, and we're the only country in Africa that is allowed. Heidi, I must ask, what is genetically modified food? I mean, I hear this all the time. Well, it's um, seeds that are made in the laboratory in an un unnatural way. So usually tomatoes can breed with tomatoes, maize can breed with maize. That's the way nature works. But now scientists have found ways to move genes from unrelated species um, into crops and um, produce new characteristics. So it's scientifically, there's, there's no agreement on whether or not this is a safe practice, if it's safe to eat. So what have you found in our food, baby food, for example? Well, no, the, the most alarming is our maize, our pup, our staple food, all genetically modified, whether it's labeled or not, even if you look at the pack and it's labelled, which is what we're asking for, makes no difference because we have no choice. It is all genetically modified. But Imran just spoke about this um, very impressive sounding legislation. So you're saying now we don't have choice? Yeah, so, so the legislation says that it must be labelled. Yay, it's labelled, but now we can't choose a non-GM product because it doesn't exist on the market. So we've been uh, petitioning Parliament to really look at that and, and create... Yeah, you've been petitioning, but I know that Imra um, Fakhri, you've been involved in the campaigning side of GMOs, which, to be honest with you, Heidi, sounds like made in a test tube. That's the food that I'm eating. <laughs> Tell us, what, what, what's been happening on the campaigning side? Well, yes, thank you very much. Um, I was principally part of the uh, consortium, I would say, with the African Centre for Biosafety and Safe Age. We were principally involved in um, campaigning for labelling. Um, uh, writing policy documents to the government in order to entrench, and mind you, like Heidi, I work specifically in the area of genetically modified foods. <clears throat> and uh, we were, I would say, um, fortunate in that uh, our submissions, we managed to force government to introduce many of the legislations that we wanted, although the final, in the final analysis, I think many of the activists were not too happy because I may add here that uh, one of the clauses uh, in the Labeling Act was that the threshold for a GMO content in a product 
was set at 5%, yeah. which according to the international standard is much too high. It uh, allows companies to get away back basically with murder yeah. in a sense. Hold that, hold that. I want to talk to Imran quickly because you're talking about the threshold of GMOs in the food that we consume. Now Imran, we know that you've been involved in the bread price fixing scandal. What oversight is there um, in terms of allowing these GMOs into what is essentially a staple, especially for kids, bread? Um, is there any regulation that says that there should be safer content in, in, in bread? Because we see all this fortified bread stuff on our shelves. Well, um, not, not really. There's not sufficient protection because um, the GM, GMO, the pro-GMO lobby has, has successfully um, lobbied the lawmakers in terms of the safety of GMO products. So in terms of pro-choice, we've got legislation saying that, that um, we are, can make informed decisions, but in terms of safety, there's not sufficient proof that GMOs are either harmful or um, not harmful. So that is the, 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 the next phase of this um, process is that there are latest studies coming out that um, proves that GMO maize has caused cancer in, in rats and that there is a direct correlation with some of the GMOs with new diseases. So what has to happen now is that that proof now has to become um, verified and then we can re-lobby in terms of food safety around those issues. Imran, I want to, I mean you just touched on a very important point. I want to come to Heidi around the issue of the science of it all. There are some who I've, I've, I've been reading who say that not everything about GMOs is bad. That GMOs do provide an opportunity to provide, to grow bigger volumes of food for an ever burgeoning population. What are your thoughts on this? Is it really that bad? No, I wouldn't agree with that at all. I mean, we've been growing GMAs in South Africa for f almost 15 years now, and it's made no impact on our food security in the country. In fact, a bag of maize meal has, has um, increased in price by 84% over the last five years. 84? Something like 84%. So a few years ago, we had um, farmers produced about six or seven million tons of surplus maize, but it didn't go to South Africans who are hungry. It went on to the international market because... The price dropped because there was so much maize in the market, so it was, it was reasonable to sell it on the international market. So GMO foods don't make a dent in food security no, anyway? surpluses don't magically go to hungry people. You still have to have money and buy food. So. Okay, I see you aging to come in here. Yeah, I just want to cite, uh, I just want to carry on from where Heidi uh, had left off. There's a very important study that has been totally ignored by governments around the world and our government in particular. It's called the ISTAD uh, report, the synth synthesis report. Um, and basically what the report set out to do is 400 of the top scientists in the world, in fact, came together and they produced this report. What it found was two very important things, that GMOs does not necessarily improve the benefit to the uh, uh, um, consumer, neither to the producer, meaning the yeah. farmer. Secondly, a very important point that it made is was that... Um, it found that, in fact, subsistence farming, agroecological methods of farming, which oh, is not wait, industrial. Wait, hold on, hold on. That's a big term. Agroecological, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, basically what it means is that you go back to the organic way of farming, you know, small scale, and that large scale farming did not necessarily improve the food supply or the food sovereignty of farmers, noting that more than 70% of the world's farmers are um, subsistence farmers. So if you go into that model, so the synthesis report basically denounced the fact that GMOs is contributing to food sovereignty. And secondly, that on the contrary, the model that we are following, which is industrial farm, is in fact not supplying the world with the necessary food sovereignty or food security. That yeah, I, I think that it's quite an important point. But I want to talk to Imran because you're talking about food sovereignty, you're talking about farmers, they are quite an important part of our economy. Um, and when we come back, Pumeza... Yes, please yeah. hold that thought. I will, I will. Hold that thought, because I also have another question for Tahrim. Yeah. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching Free Media, Free Minds. In this episode, we're talking about the media and about your rights as a consumer. Um, before we went to the ad break, I had a question for Fahri. Mm. Um, why is labeling important? And what are the legal requirements? And is all of this being monitored? Thank you, uh, Pumeza. You know, I can only speak mainly on the GMO because that is okay. where I worked on, you know, for, I cannot uh, broad, uh, focus broadly. But to your question, um, you know, l legally, if one looks at the legislation, um, as I spoke earlier, that yes, there is uh, many uh, positive things that have come out. People uh, are now more uh, empowered to, uh, companies must now label for the enforceable and so on. But the problem is the enforceability. There is no real oversight at this moment in time. And I think Heidi will speak later about no, that the corporations want to actually limit it more. But uh, Heidi will speak about that. Now, the thing is, what, what do people look for in a label? Mm -hmm. You know, there's on the label, there is, in the, in the case of GMOs, companies uh, should label, if it's 5% uh, or more, they should label contains, you know, the actual wording needs to be contains GMOs or genetically modified organisms. But there's also a clause in the legislation that stipulates um, companies can also, if, uh, if they cannot test it, uh, they can add the term may contain uh, GMOs. Now, here in <laughs> is the anomaly, you know, yeah. that, that the people are sitting with. Corporations will die for that. Yeah. They would. <laughs> but then, if, yeah. if they cannot test it, what does that mean? How how come they can't test it? Well, look, I mean, there is uh, some some of the products have been processed, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so instead of using the live uh, seed, you know, uh, the seed has been processed through the food chain. Mm -hmm. The uh, actual seed has been processed, and at the end of the food chain, it has been. Uh, it's in a form that it cannot be uh, um, fully tested to an extent. Heidi, come, come in here, you're the scientist here. And you've also, I know that, um, you, that, that uh, the African Center for Biosafety is also engaged with Monsanto. Tell us about how these corporations get away with this. I mean, basically they are injecting what sounds like Dr. <laughs> Frankenstein into our food. How do they get yeah, away with it? They've just managed to convince the government that uh, Special safety testing is not necessary because it, the food is safe. So they do 90-day studies on, on rats, and that's considered to be enough. So what should they be doing? They should be doing at least two years, on, looking at the whole life cycle of a rat. So they're not even testing on human beings. They're just doing 90 days on rats, on, on fish, on chickens. So that's what they're doing the testing on. Um, but then they have a lot of power, people like Monsanto. So, for example, they, they're major advertisers in the whole farming sphere, like Farmers Weekly, any of the TV programs around oh. agriculture. They're yes. major sponsors of those things. So they often don't allow contrary views to come into the media because they're, they're just threatened to pull funding. So we had a farmer some yeah. years back who wanted to talk about the fact that in the United States, his neighbor um, had... Uh, contaminated his farm with genetically modified crops and the company sued him for using their technology illegally. So he wanted to come and speak about that on, on I think it was AgriSA, this was some years back. Yeah. And just before the interview started he was told that it wasn't allowed to go ahead because the major sponsors had pulled, had, yeah. had threatened. So they have a lot of power in, in how the debate goes and so, what information is allowed to come out. Yeah, Imran, I mean, the question about information, do they have power over the media? Most definitely advertisers and big corporates have uh, enormous power over the media. I've encountered personally you know, many of the campaigns where the journalist would write up quite a comprehensive story, mm. but the time it goes to print, it would have, most of the gist of it would have been edited out because specifically in that edition, uh, the corporate that was uh, mentioned or the corporate that is implicated uh, is one of the major sponsors and the editor would make a choice to not compromise the advertiser. So in terms of free media, um, there's a lot of um, impact that this has on consumers' freedom to choice and access to information because 
corporates have this uh, domination of the media space through their advertising budgets in order to prevent uh, real knowledge and information from, from getting to the end users. And, and, and this is something that, that, is, that is so prevalent in, in especially uh, with the commercialization of, of media spaces, yeah. uh, specifically with regards to uh, print. And then also you find that in, 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 in television uh, becoming quite prevalent as well. I'm a little bit confused, Imran, because you're talking about the media, you're talking about advertisers. Are advertisers the media? It would seem that they have a lot of power. I mean, well, advertising is media. It's a way of communicating to the masses mm -hmm. a message a message that, that has a call to action which in, in terms of the message entices a consumer to come and buy the product. So that is a form of media and in order to, to advocate or to uh, propagate that media, they buy space in other media. So it, it's all about economics, it's all about uh, financial control and in the end most media is becoming compromised in terms of the consumer's right to know yeah. versus the advertisers um, and the, the discretion of the editors in protecting the advertisers and their I, revenue. I have to ask, I mean, this is a, you, you're talking about what sounds like quite a powerful space if consumers also play their part. Fakhri, you come from an advocacy and campaigning background. What role can consumers play in, for example, making sure that the Consumer Protection Act works for them um, and, 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 and lobbying? Um, you know, to, to make sure that that labelling has the correct information. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a very important point, uh, what role can consumers play? And more importantly, the first is to go to your manager of ShopRite Checkers or Woolworths and ask them, you know, I would like to see this labelling uh, enforced. I'm not going to buy by your shop if uh, this is not done. And to... Uh, to make sure that you do this actively. So before you continue, for the sake of our viewers at home, what are the key points that should be on a label? If I'm going in and I'm buying a tin of canned peaches, what should be on that label? Well, I mean, first and foremost, there's four products in South Africa that um, at this moment in time is commercially grown that is genetically engineered, mm. right? It is uh, maize, it is canola oil that is imported, it is cotton and it is soya. Okay. So any product, sorry ladies, the chocolates, <laughs> is a no-no because of the content. You can almost guarantee that anything that has got the soy in because of the food chain has, is genetically engineered. Soya, maize, as, which is a staple. So what do I do as a consumer? So therefore I say as a consumer, all the products that have got these uh, um, contents they, the consumer itself, should, should check these products. First of all, they should look at the yeah. labels, what they call informed uh, um, purchasing, right? Okay. So, because we need to wrap up quite soon. The one responsibility that a consumer would have is to, have an, to make an informed purchase. Okay. Ask your question. Look at your label. Heidi, from a scientific point of view, what else should we be looking for um, in terms of agitating that government get more involved? Well, I think you can um, contact the National Consumers um, Council and um, they're the ones who are overseeing the Consumer Protection Act and um, we've done a lot of um, work through our Facebook site where we, we've managed to get a lot of consumer report, uh, a lot of cons consumer support mm -hmm. and a lot of letters going to the council. It really does make a difference when government hears from consumers. We also write to retailers a lot. Yeah. Um, Imran? Thank you, Heidi. Um, we, we're going to be wrapping up soon. I have to ask you, Imran, the last question is, what can consumers do? Because uh, Heidi's told us, you know, they can write. Imran's told, um, Fakhri's told us that they need to read the labels. But as a block, as an economic block, what can consumers do? I, I think the most important thing is mobilization. I think when, what we need to do, and that's what we do as a National Consumer Forum and through our newspaper Consumer Fair as well, is mobilizing consumers around common issues and then informing them around taking positions on that. So it could be through consumer boycotts, it could be through writing to, to Parliament or the local councils, and it could also be the writing directly to the suppliers. But when consumers 
form a, a mobilized block and unified opposition. Uh, we saw that with e-tolling, we're seeing that in, in certain I instances with um, especially fair trade. Mm. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of ethical consciousness or conscious consumption happening. There's a lot of consumers becoming And the media is beginning to pick up on that. And the media is beginning to pick up on that, but specifically consumers are then um, mobilizing in groups around issues that are, are common, um, the use of uh, animal testing, um, labor practices on farms, for instance. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of issues yeah. that we could delve into that consumers um, are now becoming a lot more conscious on how they spend their money and yeah. using that power of their wallet to actually make a difference. I think that, that we've had some important Excuse the pun, it's going to be a really bad one. <laughs> Food for thought. <laughs> um, but as our guests have said, um, we as consumers definitely have an important role to play in understanding what goes into our bodies, what goes into our trolleys, what, the money, uh, what kind of money we're spending to read the label. Um, I think Imran, the last point that Imran made now was about an important block that we have as, 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 as purchasers of food, that we have real political power and that we can agitate for the media also to start engaging with some of these things, don't you think? Yeah, yeah but where, then again, um, to be honest, the only thing most of the time I look at is just the expiry date. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> yeah, I, that, that's, that's an important thing. That's a really important thing. Yeah. Thank you for watching. From me, Haldi Janssen. And me, Pumez Amtegazi. Till we meet again on Free, free media, media, Free Minds. I am ready.